Good afternoon. My name is Ala McCoy. I am Director of Startup Support at the University of Maryland's UM Ventures. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you who joined us today for the next installment in Startup Fundamentals Workshop Series, both live webinar audience and those watching a recorded version of on our Startup UMD YouTube channel. This workshop series is offered by UM Ventures in collaboration with MTech at the Clark School of Engineering at the University of Maryland. To everyone attending the live session, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And also our speaker will be asking some basic questions um, and you can put answers to those um, in the chat. This session is recorded and will be posted uh, on our Startup UMD YouTube channel, so you may submit your questions anonymously if you would like to do so. Uh, at the end of the session, you will be able to raise your hand and um, we will unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask your question live if you wish to do so. Or you can just keep, uh, keep typing that up. So today's session will cover a very important topic, marketing. Um, you may have the best product out there powered by cutting edge technology, but if you can't communicate its existence or value to your potential customers, your startup is unlikely to be successful. So today I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Tom Christensen. Uh, Tom is an entrepreneur himself. Um, he founded a company called Marketing As Needed, um, of which he is a founder and chief marketing officer. Thank you, Tom, for joining us and sharing your expertise with us today. The microphone is yours. I'll um, stop talking, turn off my camera and my mic, but I'm here in the background. So um, ping me if you need me. I'm here. So thank you so much again, Tom. Mike is yours. No, thank you. I, I firstly want to thank uh, Alan McCoy for having me here. Um, and we collaborated in selecting the topic. There are so many things that I'm enthusiastic about when it comes to both entre entrepreneurship and education. And so this opportunity to speak to all of you is exactly how I love spending my time. So really appreciate it. And of the many topics I love discussing, um, there are so many aspects and elements of marketing. The one that we will be talking about today is full spectrum marketing, which for the sake of ease, you can think about it as customer lifecycle marketing on steroids. Um, Ala has told me that the uh, maturity of the products or IP or the business structures you're working with are at various states of maturity. And so I've thought about that in terms of preparing the content. And in, in order to be uh, inclusive, we are covering this topic from both a very aspirational point of view. How do you want this to look in your organization two, five years down the road? And a very tactical um, point of view. So how can you institute these things today uh, into your organization or in, into your thinking about your organization. Uh, the tactics we're going to be talking about, they get increasingly important as your company grows and matures, but uh, they also become more difficult to introduce um, as the company, you know, sort of culture takes shape. Um, so no matter where you are in your offering, no matter where you are in thinking about your business um, in terms of readiness, I think these, these concepts that I'm going to be showing you are going to be very practical today. Uh, in terms of today's agenda, um, I always have a mission. I always have a goal. So my goals for you are firstly, to understand full spectrum marketing. What is it that we are even talking about here today? And what I would love for you to walk out from is to personally select one or two actions from this list of five that you can implement today. And how we're gonna get there is we're gonna be talking about a few different things. We're gonna be defining it. What is full spectrum marketing? We're going to be talking about those five actions that you can take to improve marketing at every stage. And we're going to cap it off with where you should invest your next dollar or more realistically, your next minute. And finally, uh, we'll have an open Q&A at the end. Um, as Ella said, uh, please put your questions into chat. She will be moderating those, I believe. If there are, is anything that's unclear on a slide or any terminology jargon that I'm using, please ask for clarification. I want everybody to be fully um, aware of what we're discussing at every give, given point. 
That said, if there's anything sort of outside of the scope of this topic, if you have another question about marketing or that's just not um, part of this content, uh, would love to discuss that, um, but that's, uh, we can discuss that during the Q&A portion. So, um, a little bit more about me um, to um, explain what I'm doing on this camera before you. Uh, as Alice said, I'm, my name is Tom Christensen. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer, Founder, Owner of Marketing As Needed. We provide fractional marketing services, uh, mostly to early stage B2B companies that are trying to figure out exactly how they should be um, building out their marketing teams, scaling marketing as they're trying to accelerate their uh, revenue operations. I am a three-time startup veteran, and of those three, twice I've been the first marketing hire and built out the marketing teams for Series A tech companies. The products and services that I've worked on have been super interesting technologies ranging from augmented reality, AI, in the financial technology vertical, in the healthcare IT vertical, also working on web marketplaces. So it really spans the gamut. Um, not only have I worked on this, that's also my educational background. Like I said, I'm very passionate about the intersection between entrepreneurship and education as proven. Um, here, I, I, I just got back from my 20th reunion in, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Uh, from the Wharton undergraduate program where I studied marketing and entrepreneurship and then went off to my first career, which was uh, a professional actor in Los Angeles. This picture of me that hopefully you can all see is a computer rendered version of me from the video game NBA 2K15. Uh, I do not play basketball. I cannot play basketball. Um, but my character was a very aggressive agent who was trying to take advantage of a street basketball player who was trying to go pro. So for any of you uh, video game fans out there, um, there's a, a minute possibility that um, you've seen this uh, image before. And then after that career, um, I went back and I got a second business degree also at the intersection of marketing and entrepreneurship, this time from UCLA. So I'm very excited about the subject. Now, I'm very much a dad. I live in Columbia, Maryland. Um, on the weekends, I do some uh, improv comedy up in Baltimore and try to squeeze in a couple of yoga sessions. So just a little bit about me. Firstly, we're gonna define what a buyer touch point is. You're gonna hear the word touch point an inordinate number of times during this session. And I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly what we're trying to refer to. So let's set the table. A buyer touch point is simply an interaction. It is any interaction a buyer has with your business, your product, your service, or your team. That means there are a lot of them. There are a couple of different types that we can discuss. Direct touch points. This is probably what you're thinking about in a lot of the marketing you're considering, sort of one-to-one -one between a company and a buyer. It could be a phone call, it could be an email, direct mail, something that you have a lot of control over. There, it's very trackable, traceable, and you have a lot of control over optimizing it and improving it. Additionally, I want you to be thinking about in the back of your heads indirect interactions, indirect touch points sort of one-to-many, sort of the untrackable um, things, right? So, you know, broadcast ads that where you don't get direct measurement or um, word of mouth or people coming across your product on a celebrity that they see. Um, sort of like the, you can think about it as sort of, sort of environmental exposure to what you are doing in your business. For the ease of this um, conversation and just to try to anchor it to some real activities that you can do. You can think about it um, in terms of email, an email that you are sending to your, your customer. Let's move on and discuss the definition of what we're here to discuss. What is full spectrum marketing? Full spectrum marketing is this philosophy of seeing every single one of those buyer touch points as a lever 
to maximize your profit. Okay, so by our touch points, if that's our definition, if that's our very broad definition of those, they clearly occur before buyers are even aware that you're having an offering. They might see your branding, they might uh, see an email come through and they just don't even recognize it. They also continue after the relationship ends. So they are dissatisfied with your product. They go off and do something else. They no longer have a need for it, but those relationships persist and, and they, they have an impact. The goal of thinking about things in terms of this framework, this full spectrum marketing, is to get everyone at your organization to commit. To commit to the idea that every single buyer touch point is a lever. I'm going to give you an example, one of my favorite, one of my favorite examples. I don't really know. Um, uh, I would love to see hands and faces because for me, this is very relevant. I've got a, I've got a child. Um, I'm assuming some of you have been to Disneyland. I'm also assuming some of you have been to Legoland and I'm assuming some of you have been to both. There is this belief out there that I've found true, which is you never see a piece of trash on the ground at Disneyland. Um, that is not true for Legoland. You most definitely see trash on the ground at Legoland. And it's a, it's a result of active and ongoing business decisions, and they are observed by their customers, right? I'm not saying one is better than the other, but um, there is an impact, both on the finances of Disneyland and Legoland and on the customer perception, right? It is not inexpensive to keep Disneyland clean, clean and, and operating, right? They coach all of their staff to consider themselves as cast members. There's intense training that uh, costs a lot of money. There are reviews that cost a lot of money, right? The like everything about Disneyland from the operations slide side is more expensive. It results in a different product. And that product is seen differently by the end consumer. So trash on the ground at Legoland, no trash on the ground at Disneyland. Does that impact how people feel about them? Does that impact how buyers are more likely to recommend one experience versus the other? This is um, just to frame the idea that touch points happen. They happen a lot. They happen in a lot of different ways and they are relevant. With that said, we are going forward for the rest of the hour with this idea in mind. Every interaction will either improve or diminish your brand. There are no neutral interactions, right? When they've seen your product, when they've interacted with you in some way, it is either good or in the minds of the buyers, or it is bad in the minds of the buyers. So if this is true, if logically all touch points matter, then we are going to focus on the following. We want to identify touch points, we want to improve touch points, and we want to introduce touch points. We want to identify, monitor, and measure the touch points our buyers have with us. It's easy to stop tracking the small ones, right? These really minute ones, because it takes effort and the time cost, the, the, the monetary cost adds up, but it pays dividends. We want to improve those that add value and we have the opportunity to eliminate those that detract value. And since most of you are uh, at startups, it's the whole, the whole purpose of this, right? There is a chance that our customers have had no touch points with us. That they have no, no interaction or no exposure to our brand or company or service. And so it's very critical to be aware of when and how to introduce new touch points, right? We want to introduce new touch points that will attract, right? Bring, bring the right customers to us, amplify, and that is amplify the message that we're putting out there, right? because it's very expensive to do it independently. We want to also want to amplify the size of our deals, right? We want to increase the size of our opportunities and we want to accelerate things. We want to 
make as short as possible the time from when someone doesn't know at all about our uh, offering to the time they are a paying customer. This is where we stop for a quick moment and say, we are talking about one aspect of marketing that's predicated on the assumption that you on this call, you watching this webinar, know to a pretty high degree your customer. How well do you know your buyer? If you do not know your buyer, there is activity that has to occur before these things, right? And your strategy needs to be aimed in the right direction before you put any resources, time or money behind it. So I will give you one example from a semi, semi hypothetical example uh, from the healthcare IT universe, right? Imagine a software, a, uh, a uh, fr software that a staff, staff uses um, at any organization where they serve uh, healthcare patients, right? And we have two very different ideal customer profiles, ICPs. One is this sort of private practice, and one is this hospital or integrated delivery network, you know, chain of hospitals and pharmacies and things like that. On one side, we, you know, we'll label one as a small to medium business. And they typically have two to 20 physicians. They have one office location. And from the needs of the staff users, they, they just need an easy interface, right? What they've been doing is clunky and hard and uh, there's staff turnover and they want to leave. The business objective is to fill appointments. An appointment scene is appointment um, build, and that's revenue in the pockets of the business. The buyer, in this case, is both the practice manager, right? They, they work at that office and they actually use the product, right? So they're one and the same. And they have no technical support, right? Critical to understanding how that person is going to be persuaded to learn more about this product and make the purchase decision, right? Take, for example, again, same software, the enterprise ideal customer profile. They have over 500 physicians. They have multiple offices. Their needs are they need to be able to configure it themselves. This is an automated tool that they can't do it themselves. They're, they're relying on customer service. It's the reason they're out in the market right now. They are dissatisfied with alternatives that don't provide self-configuration. The business need is they are in a metropolitan area and they have a very competitive hospital that offers a very similar um, level of customer service and they need to beat them, right? It is a live or die situation. They're fighting for a fraction of that market. Their buyer is in this elusive digital transformation role, right? Nobody even knows what it means or, uh, or what they do on a daily basis, but they're responsible for transforming their organization through any means necessary into a digital first organization. And they have technical support, they have large IT supports and legal teams, but they act in as much as they are opportunities to sell the product, they are also hurdles, right? So again, talking about touch points, looking at this, the touch points you select and optimize for are gonna look incredibly different based off of who you're trying to reach who your, who your buyer is. So if you have not already done this, before we get into every action, actions one through five, talk to your buyer. Understand your buyer, both the people and the organization. You wanna understand how they think, you wanna understand how they go about their business, right? So what business needs do they have, right? What are they trying to accomplish? From the personal perspective, what emotional needs do they have? Are they trying to win their boss's approval, right? Are they just trying to get home? Um, how do they manage these needs now? What are the substitutes? How do they buy? One person needs one person's approval and they've got total budget authority? Or is it a, a committee decision of 15 individuals on a strict uh, budget and they have to approach it like through a uh, RFP or something, a uh, requ request for proposal. It has to go through this formal process. How will they prioritize purchases right now? Has the CEO said, I want everything to be powered by AI in the next 18 months? 
pretty good if you're power, if your solution's powered by AI, or um, do they have some other uh, mechanism for prioritizing their uh, purchases? When do they buy, right? Is your total window for this, um, like almost like the tax season, and if it's like uh, April 16th, too bad you're out of luck. And this one, this one's one of my absolute favorites is, um, what vocabulary does the actual buyer use when discussing all of the activity above? Once you have that data, you are ready to go back to this mission at hand, this full spectrum mission of looking at the touch points, bettering the uh, touch points, and bringing on new touch points. The first activity you want, once you get to a place where you feel like you know you can reach your customer, you've had customer conversations, you need to choose your champion. You need one true believer to own this belief, this thought process internally. This is going to be a lot of work. It is thought work, it is communication, coordination, analysis that generates a clear picture of what your buyer needs and what your buyer responds to. And this person is going to proliferate it with everybody else that you work with. And so this person needs to have kind of a, a pretty interesting profile. And if you were in an organization of one, I think you know who the champion is, it's, it's you. You need to act as the voice of the buyer, right? What does the buyer think about this? How do we make sure that we don't lose sight of why, why they're going to um, give us money for this in the first place? Why do they have willingness to pay at all? They need to be emotionally intelligent, right? It takes a lot of skill to talk to people who have different functions across the organization, people who may be part-time or contractors or um, have a very different skill set or uh, be um, neurodiverse, right? Uh, they have to be capable of engaging a broad set of people. They have to be process oriented, right? Everything that we're talking about here is going to be something that you want on an ongoing basis. And so you're gonna to want to improve it, document it, put it into your lifeblood of your organization. You will be doing this again. So someone needs to capture and create an optimized process. If this person is not you, right? If your organization is starting to grow, then you must also, they must also have visible support of the leadership, right? Because they are tasked with going into everyone's work streams and saying, we would like to add something, uh, that, that, um, that mandate has to come from the top. And so they must have visible uh, leadership, a visible support. Their first main task, once you've found this person or once you've adopted this mentality, is for you to map the customer journey, okay? And what do I mean by that? You are going to itemize every buyer touch point that you are aware of or you can track down that has led a customer from zero awareness into your organization. And when I say every, I mean every email, every phone call, every cupcake delivery you sent to them, the ad clicks they had, form fills, demos, the contract revisions, right? Coffee dates, etc. Something occurred between them and you, you are going to create it, right? Um, when we're talking about these models, they sound very linear, right? I am not in the market. I am now in the market. I found your product. Now I'm a customer. The reality is never that clear. And so itemizing those buyer touch points will give you a very accurate uh, uh, jumping off point to do a lot of the uh, remaining work. If you have multiple buyers, in multiple segments, this is going to be uh, a repeated process. The good news in that case is you probably have, you know, a very rapidly expanding business. It clearly adds a level of um, complexity to doing this work, but uh, it also raises the importance of doing it well. I'm about to show you a couple of models. 
But the critical thing here is that the models I'm about to show you are generic models. They are not your models, right? What your organization, what your business needs is a model that's created that accurately and distinctly represents your buyer's journey. On the left is a pretty typical customer life cycle uh, guide. People start in sort of awareness mode. They don't really know who you are. and They're starting to warm up to you and say, okay, I know your product a little bit. For this one, I think I use a drone example later. Let's talk about drones. So yeah, okay, they, they have a drone that does um, you know, some sort of industrial work. Okay, cool. Now, um, I saw you at a conference and I heard you say something compelling. So now I'm, I'm genuinely considering your product, right? And run into you and had a, you know, sat down at lunch with one of your representatives and I had that touch point. Now I'm actively considering you. Okay, I took it back to the team and we are ready to buy, right? Like we've seen the, we've seen the benefit. There's a value here to us. We're gonna purchase this thing. And that's a whole phase, right? A bunch of you know communication back and forth. And now I've started giving you money. I'm in this retention phase, right? Where you don't want me to stop paying you money. So you're going to do things, right? You're going to communicate and engage with me in a way um, to make sure that I continue the relationship. And then uh, I get to a place where I'm so happy I'm gonna start advocating for you. I think there's a critical flaw in this. I think advocacy comes immediately after purchase. Right. I even was speaking with a friend uh, in um, financial uh, advisory um, yesterday and uh, the time to get advocacy from a customer is immediately after the purchase. And there's a distinct reason for that. They came to you with a problem, some sort of need. Purchasing your product resolves that problem, right? So they are coming from bad and going to good at this point in time. They're likely very well informed about your product, it like, likely takes up a big share of their mind space. Now is the time to say, oh, you seem very excited about this. How can we get your, capture your case study, get a testimonial. What can we do to, get, um, to work with you, to you know, interact with your network so that, um, your friends want to adopt this product too because you are very uh, you have a very salient story about what this fixed for you so i just pointing that out and you don't don't put off advocacy people become less likely to advocate over time generally speaking on this right hand side if you take the left hand pie chart and sort of spread it out um, it's very similar right there are buckets of activity based on what the customer buyer might be thinking and here they've mapped a bunch of different channels, right? Social media or influencer outreach or very specific um, ad types. Again, this is going to look different for your organization. Don't look at one of these and try to map your uh, marketing outreach to one of these. It will not uh, be efficient, it will not be um, cash efficient, right? You're gonna spend money in the wrong places. But you can see how this one on the right side shows a little more of the loopbacks and the interaction between where a customer is. It's not this linear um, uh, model for customer behavior. We need to capture all that data, right? That's what this champion is doing or this champion's delegate is doing. Start simple, open a spreadsheet, collect the following data points. What was the message? Oh, it was an email that said, hey, you might, you know, I saw your title, you might be in this market, uh, this is what we do. What was the channel? That was the email channel, right? Who sent it? Well, um, marketing sent it using some sort of automated tool um, and there was a marketing analyst, low level of marketing analyst who shipped it uh, and that person reports to the head of marketing and uh, they sent it to um, the COO of a company about this size. It, they got it, a very specific person got it. Was there an outcome? No, they didn't do anything with that. And then who is accountable for improving that outcome? Okay, so maybe it's the um, head of marketing. Head of marketing's job is to make sure people take more actions when that is sent. 
you're getting a spreadsheet, you're collecting all of this data, and now, now you can go back to one of those simple models and distill it into, okay, these, this is sort of how our buyer goes through the purchase process. This is the activity we've taken. I see some gaps in here. I see some, oh, that didn't go right, or this, went, this was very effective, let's do more of that. But it's about capturing that data early and being very methodical about it. I think this might be my favorite slide. I want you to picture the almighty fruit roll up. Now, I wish I could see everyone's faces because uh, um, you either know fruit roll ups or you don't, right? Like as a child of the eighties, like uh, it was manna from heaven. I was, fruit roll ups were, it's just gelatin and sugar that you play with, with your dirty hands and then you eat. It's absolutely disgusting. But it's essentially a sheet of, of uh, gummy, right? And it looks very solid when you unroll it and it adheres to the plastic strip. It looks like a solid mat, right, of food. But when you do what you're supposed to do, which is take it off and you start playing with it and you start stretching it out, what looked solid, all of the holes become very uh, distinct, right? You start seeing where the gaps are. And what looked like a solid thing is now um, you can see all how permeable it is, right? How flawed it is in this analogy. And so that's what you want to do with your customer data, right? You want to stretch it out, okay? If you had a contracting conversation, was it three emails or was it four emails? Okay, why was it four emails and not two? What, did the customer have to ask for information that you did not provide? Um, was there a benefit to that delay? Uh, would it have shortened the cycle or improved the likelihood of sealing that deal if you had led with that information or put that, you know, been more proactive in that? What you say, when you say it, where you say it, you can see all of that. And the simple act of gathering that data will fix so much and help optimize so much, right? Because just capturing it, everybody, for the most part, has very high, uh, you know, good intentions for your business. And if they see, oh, that could have been better, they just fix it next time, right? But if they're not observing, if they're not tracking these touch points, um, it's very hard to uh, optimize uh, those touch points. Action number two. Okay, now that we know how a buyer buys from us uh, and what a buyer feels, um, we want to convert everybody at this organization to be an advocate. Our goal is to bring, make everyone in the company take personal responsibility for this buyer satisfaction, right? In a small organization, an organization of one or 50, right? Most people will have a direct conversation with a client. As you get bigger than that, the touch points become more obscure, right? But you still have people who never get on the phone with a customer their work does impact customer satisfaction. So you want them to run that through their filter. How do you get them to adopt this mentality? You can do it through overt trainings, right? Overt actions like trainings. Those are very effective, but they're very costly. You need to prep for them. Everybody needs to stop their day, take the training. In terms of time cost, they're very uh, expensive. What I want you to focus on here in the tactic that I want you to adopt today, the subtle actions, the nudges. I want you to do sneaky little things that will help build this customer centrism into your culture as it grows. And if you start with a company of one, it'll be that much easier. I want you to think, if you haven't read it, this book, Atomic Habits, uh, it's really just about making good habits, you know, building good habits and breaking down bad ones. And spoiler alert, it's about adding friction to bad habits and making easier good habits. That's it, that's all there is to it. In the context of language, right, and I want you to think about this one idea, convert versus buy. There's this um, model of the customer life cycle that always puts people in the conversion uh, section. Oh, we, they, we're converting them. When's the last time you, as a buyer, ever converted? Right? When's the last time you've used that phrase? When's the last time you converted a pair of Nikes? When's the last time you've 
converted a honeymoon trip. No, you didn't. You bought it. You purchased it, right? Like, why are we using language that is irrelevant or even maybe like antagonistic to the buyer? Go in, in your emails, in your documents, replace technical jargon and business speak with the language you have observed your buyers use, right? This is from that research period. So now that we've converted everybody, everybody is excited about it, we want to make it easy for them. And we do this by adding forcing functions for everyone across the organization. If every person bears responsibility for buyer satisfaction, make it easy for them to comply and make it hard for them to defect. I'll give you a super easy one. Even if you're a small organization, you probably have a salesperson or a consultant closing deals for you, reaching out, talking directly to buyers, trying to move money. You want everything we know about that buyer to live in one place. In an organization one, it's a document or a spreadsheet. In a large organization, is the, is the uh, customer relationship manager a Salesforce, a HubSpot, right? Some sort of tool, doesn't matter, but it lives in one place. The reason you want it to live in one place is that you can analyze it, track it, look for opportunity, the next touch point, plan the next touch point, but you need good data. So you need to add a forcing function to make it full of good data because I trust me, like no organization has fantastic data around this. To do so, you need to block incomplete records, right? Like in, in, sales, in Salesforce, it's very easy to do this. Oh, you didn't fill in this note? Sorry, you can't continue. You can't pass go and you can't collect your $200, right? You can also tie compensation to the process. Are people adhering and improving the, um, the sort of customer centrism? Uh, one that's harder to uh, pin down is for things further away from sales. For example, think about fi finance, right? Or um, accounts receivable. What you can do for everybody is when you talk at town halls or, you know, Friday check-ins or anytime that you're talking uh, stand-ups, your, your retrospectives, ask for an explanation of how something impacted the customer. Think about finance, accounts payable or accounts receivable. They went from like drop shipping people to PDFs to now automating monthly invoices. And from the customer perspective, we can say customers are now seeing this sort of professional upgrade. We went from like super scrappy startup, sending them, you know, back of envelope. And now they can see that we are evolving into a more secure company, right? We are upgrading our operations. That means we will be around to continue to serve them, right? And prompting people for that explanation of how does this impact the customer will just keep people, keep it top of mind for everybody. Action number four, you are gonna be operating your business by measuring a lot of things, right? And you will have data around what employees are doing and you will have employees around their outcomes and you will have uh, data around customer, uh, customer outcomes. Focus on measuring customer actions. Whatever data that you're gathering as you build up this business, did, did the customer do something? That's the KPI, that's the metric, that's the observable you want to put first. Let's talk about an example for, um, I gotta move, move my menu bar. An example of a sales email you're sending out after a demo with a case study to prove the point that your product works and um, you are a drone company. The positive outcomes you could have could be the customer knows something, which is good. They feel something, which is better, or they do something, which is best. So in this case, I sent an email to the buyer, the buyer is now thinking, okay, well, our alpha team has a drone that's capable of going into dangerous conditions and reducing staff time in field. Okay, I know that, that's good. That's better than me not knowing that. I want them to feel like alpha team could keep my staff safe and cut my costs, right? There is a personal connection to that. That's good, right? It may, that's gonna stick in my head. Best, I mean, better outcome yet is, oh, I replied to the alpha team asking to learn more. I saw the demo, 
I want to I want to re see the ROI, right? So I want to go through the business case with somebody, right? You want your customers to do something. You want your team internally to be asking, did they do something, right? So for every touch point, did we have a desired action, and did the buyer take it? Action number five should look pretty similar, pretty familiar. You got to talk to your buyers. Right. If you on this call have a product, no matter the state, you should have time this week on the calendar of someone who might have the capability of buying your product. You will talk to them about it. You will hear honest opinions about it. And when you're talking about these individual touch points, you want to know how they would react to it. So in regards to your targeting, right? How do they feel about this solution, right? When you have this touch point, when you send them a document, does that resonate with them? Do they feel like that product fits in their world? Uh, if not, I mean, it might not be the right buyer, right? You might not have product market fit. If it is the right buyer, did they respond to the message? Did you phrase it in a way that is persuasive to them? Do they see their, their peers? Do they see their opportunity? Does it reflect their goals and their needs? Um, again, going back to the language, are you using the vocabulary the buyer uses to talk about their own pain, right? Would they say it in this way? And then it's time to think about efficient channels, right? You don't want to be like spending in ads before you've figured out those first two things. So now that we have confirmed with our buyers that they are our buyers, now that we have uh, checked the messaging and said, okay, this is, this is the best messaging that we can come up with. Now we can take that message, put some dollars behind it and push it out to a new group of people to see if they will react in a positive way as well. So you can find out which touch points are cost effective, right? There are plenty of channels, right? There is, you know, um, you know, direct mail, you have social media, you have search engine and marketing, you have conferences, right? You have just going up and knocking on someone's door, but which are the ones that are going to uh, be cost effective because uh, you have to remain cost effective to remain in business. So go talk to your buyers. Here's a little joke from The Simpsons somewhere in the 90s. Beware of over indexing on a single buyer's point of view, though. Uh, this is from an episode. Uh, Lisa's grousing with her grandfather, saying, I'm too young, no one takes me seriously. I'm too old, no one takes me seriously. Homer walks in and says, I'm a white male between the ages of 18 and 45. Everybody listens to me, no matter how stupid my ideas are. And the product that they've built on that is nuts and gum together at last. So as critical as it is to gather buyer data, do a sanity check. Make sure you're not over indexing on uh, someone who has a, a very particular need or that their company doesn't behave the way other companies behave in terms of purchasing. Buyer data is still going to be your most critical North Star in terms of identifying where your future revenue comes from. Uh, but you always want to be checking to make sure that the information you have is representative of the market you're going into and not just the uh, conversations you were able to uh, manufacture. So driving this home, where do we want to spend our next time? I've given you the actions. I hope you found some that um, appeal to you or that you can see the value in. In terms of what should I be doing now? Think about this in terms of buyer awareness. Invest your time and dollars in the buyers that are in market for what you've got or what you're developing. So in this model, right, we go from completely unaware to simply just aware, right? The further you are away from a buyer in market, the more expensive it is going to be to induce them through any touch point to take an action. So if they're unaware, they don't even have, know they have a problem. So you have to educate them on that. Problem aware, they know they have a problem, but they don't even know there's a solution out there. Solution aware, they know they have a problem and that the solution exists. But they don't know about your solution, right? That's a, good, that's a good place to start, right? As a startup, nobody knows about your solution. And then product aware, they know they have a problem, they know your solution exists, 
they aren't convinced. That's probably the next phase, right? Is say, okay, well, do I want to be the first purchaser of your product? And then this is the phase you want to be driving people to, right? They know they have a problem, they are aware of your solution, and they are just ready to buy, right? Like the timing's right, the budget's right, all of those things. That's a very advanced and that's a very process um, optimization place for marketing. Um, but all of this uh, can be improved and all of this can be affected by, by marketing. The most expensive, as I'll reiterate, is taking people from unaware to aware that it exists at all, right? It also happens to be where there are no competitors. So you have to really think about um, is the cost of educating uh, going to be likely to be recouped in the fact that we're the first to market in whatever this, um, whatever this is. I've used up my time. I'm going to go quickly through this bonus round. As you mature your marketing, you will be very excited about doing a lot of marketing, possibly. Stick to one message in one channel as long as you can. Don't, you will feel the FOMO, just breathe through it. You're not losing out. Marketing poorly is way more expensive than not marketing. So the idea is to create efficiencies before complexity. If, if sending personalized emails one-to-one -one is working, do that and create the efficiencies there. Make it inexpensive from an operational perspective to do and continue on. Learn to love the spreadsheet. Tools are nice. Software is nice. I get about 100 emails a day from people trying to sell me marketing software. They do help manage complexity. They also create complexity. Go lo-fi, do this on a spreadsheet. It's shareable. It's a universal language. Everybody, everybody, can, everybody can look at a spreadsheet, right? You don't need to share um, login credentials for a spreadsheet. So stick with the basics there. I wanna thank you for your time. We're gonna move into Q&A right now. But um, in true marketing fashion, uh, fashion, I want to show you um, what I would recommend you do, which is I want you to have a call to action. You want your buyers, you want your audience to do something, right? So I would love for you to email me. Here's my personal email, tom at marketingisneeded.com. Please reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, as I said, I'm a local. Um, I like to go to uh, startup events and learn myself and uh, get involved in the community uh, in and around the DC to Baltimore corridor. So hopefully we run into each other connect with me there. And if you want to discuss um, your product or uh, your business idea um, on a more um, specific level, um, the only way to do that is if we have a conversation. So uh, feel free to reach out. Um, you can um, set time with me or just learn more at marketingisneeded.com. And uh, I'm just very grateful for having the opportunity to talk to you all today. And um, now I think uh, is a great time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Tom. This has been a, a very interesting and very informative session. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, please submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function, or you can also this time raise your hand and I can unmute your, um, your mic and you can ask a question that way. So we have a first question. Can you use this technique in attracting investors? Uh, yes, the question is, can you use this technique in attracting investors? All of the activities I've mentioned, hopefully, um, if, if, you, if you take a step back, they are text techniques for two things. One is um, increase your persuasion and uh, improve your operations. So yes, if, you, if your goal, if your audience, let's just call investors, buy, uh, you're the buyers investors. If you are trying to reach them, if you are trying to persuade them, if you want them to take an action, uh, if there are uh, multiple investors at a single organization, all of these things apply. All of these uh, things are applicable to um, creating efficiencies around persuading people to take an action. So um, I personally can see that there. And um, if there is a um, investor profile, 
that you are trying to uh, get to invest in you, right? You can very clearly see how identifying that uh, customer profile, talking to people, or sorry, investor profile, talking to those investors, getting their language, understanding how they think about portfolio companies, understanding how they think about exits and scale and the risk profile that they're looking to take on. That deep knowledge informs everything that you're doing downstream. I'm going to stop share here um, and I'm going to continue here. Um, can you, I see another uh, anonymous attendee, um, very mysterious. Can you offer advice about planning a focus group? Oh, you're welcome, Lisa. Uh, you, a focus group to learn more about potential customers and how they view your product. Yes, um, I could give you a lot of advice about both um, planning that focus group, um, both in terms of uh, thinking through your goals of that fo focus group, thinking through how to moderate that focus group, you know, what to do after that. It's very going to be, um, you know, there are broad strokes that you can apply to essentially any focus group, right? Um, know what your goals are going in. Know what your goals are coming out. Know who your buyer is. If you don't know who your buyer is, maybe that's the focus, that's the point of the focus group. Um, if I knew, I think I knew a little bit about uh, the pr uh, product or service, it might inform uh, the advice a little more um, granularly or targeted. But um, yeah, if you have a secondary question as a follow up to that, um, focus groups are incredibly effective. In terms of buyer research, you have um, you have a spectrum, right? You can do very uh, uh, inexpensive. Uh, research that results in very poor quality information. Uh, you could do very expensive research that reads, reaches a broad audience, but you could probably only get them for a couple of questions. You could do one-to-one -one outreach, speaking to a specific buyer. They all have a, a place. If you've decided on focus groups because you know you've had deep conversations with one person and high conversations with um, many people, then a focus group might be a good fit. Um, so, uh, for whomever uh, posted that question, I welcome you to um, have, you know, reaching out to me and I would be happy to take it a step further. No question, but I wanted, I just want to reinforce your comment about enforcing people to enter data. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, this, this, uh, this problem's not going anywhere, right? There's a whole market out there for addressing this problem, right? So whoever's got that solution, you know, I'll, I'll co-invest. But um, in our sales personas employment contract, I put a sentence that entering CRM data was a job requirement and refusal to do so was grounds for dismissal. It set expectations from day one. I think because we're talking about sales anonymous is at least the salesperson has an understanding that they have a a duty to to interact with the customer. Broadly speaking about this presentation, there are many functions in their training or their academic background. They do not see themselves as having a duty to be stewards of the company or to be stewards of these touch to improve them, to identify, to know them about them. So um, I find that salespersons, although they um, they are more frequently uh, should be spending their time, you know, going out and hunting because that's their skill set and that's their contribution to the company. Uh, for the other functions as well, right? You want to set a company culture where this is this is just how we talk about it, right? You're an engineer. You're you know, you're in quality control, right? Like that clearly has an impact on on customers. Right, you are um, you are an admin, and you uh, oversee the facilities of our main headquarters. And your job is to, you just you're just visible, right? How you show up to work, that you show up to work, that you're not on your phone or clipping your net. Like everything is seen by a customer, or at least um, you should set that expectation. Do you think a person can effectively market a product without being a product specialist, i.e., a generalist? business development professional working for a biotech research firm. I so the question um, effective or like the, the phrase effective, a lot of times I substitute efficient 
And when I say efficient, I mean cash efficient. Can a person do something well without it being overly costly to the organization? Training costs money, hiring specialists costs money, doing things poorly and having to redo things costs money. A person who is um, goal oriented, who knows what the outcome is they're trying to achieve and has a very logical approach to the process by which they get there can be effective in a number of roles. I've had, I told you, I was an actor for 10 years, right? Like I have had so many um, jobs over the past 20 years in so many different capacities. There's probably not something that I haven't done, right? But um, it's all been accretive, right? And it's especially helpful in a startup environment where people wear different hats, right? You just don't have the bodies to get all the functions done. People can't just be like, oh, I do this and I only do this and I only look at this part of the organization. I think generalists are uh, incredibly value, especially at the you know, seed to angel to series A phase where we're still figure, trying to figure out how this organization needs to work to deliver this value to customers. So long-winded answer to be say yes. Al, I know that we um, are pretty much coming up on time. I'll reiterate the call to action, which is um, if you enjoy talking about marketing, if there is a burning question you have about marketing that is was very much out of scope of this because this is a very targeted conversation, um, I welcome having those conversations with you. I enjoy being part of this um, community. And I wish you the absolute best of luck as you develop your IP and consider different ways of taking your product to market. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation, a very insightful presentation, and, uh, and most importantly, very practical call to action. Um, hopefully, that, hopefully the audience took that away as well. Um, and please feel free to email me um, and uh, let me know if there are any particular other marketing topics that we could invite Tom to present again sometime in the fall. Um, let me know and uh, I'll communicate that to Tom and we can see what we can do for maybe sometime September, October, November timeline. But again, thank you so much, Tom. This is fantastic. Uh, we will be uploading this workshop to uh, Startup UMD YouTube channel where you can watch it again. Or to those who missed uh, the live session, unfortunately, you won't be able to ask questions, but uh, you'll be able to hear and see uh, what other questions were asked and answered. Again, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, fantastic. And look forward to uh, possible another collaboration in the future. Oh, that would be so much fun. Thank you, Ella. Thank you and have a great day. Uh, thank you to all participants as well. Thank you for great questions. Have a good day.